listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please check the ICDL parent website at the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning for a free virtual floor time consultation or for the weekly parent support meetings. We aim to help you implement your program at home using the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model, or DIR. Taking into account your child's developmental level, their individual differences, and using your relationship with them to help promote and support their development. Welcome this week to Affect Autism. We have Jahan Shahata Abubakar, who is a speech and language pathologist at Clinical Communication Consultants in Thornhill, Ontario, which is just north of Toronto. She is a trainer with both the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning and Perfectum in the Developmental Individual Differences relationship-based model or DIR floor time. And today we're going to discuss what to expect from a developmentally based speech and language pathologist. Welcome, Jahan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's nice to have you back. We, we did a podcast about a year or so ago on scripting, and I know it's been very helpful to some of the parents I've talked about it with. Um, and today's idea really came from the online parent support group that I do weekly through ICDL, where um, a parent said to me about her newly diagnosed two and a half year old daughter, oh, you know, I thought when we started speech and language therapy, my child who's nonverbal would start, start talking and implied right away. So that really is something that is a whole experience when parents get that new diagnosis. Uh, my own son, when he had his brain inflammation, had been talking before, wasn't talking after, and going through the whole idea of when is he going to start talking again? Um, what do we expect? So it's great to bring you on and discuss this topic. Yes, and it is a very, very crucial topic. And it is crucial in the sense that it happens in the best of families again and again. As soon as I would meet the family for the first time, one of the most important question and concern they have is if it's a question of speaking, when will he be speaking? If it's a question of language, when are we going to be able to converse, to talk? It's an important question because unfortunately, as speech language pathologists, as a field and profession, it has evolved, it has grown. And we haven't yet, only today, I found myself reflecting back what an opportunity for speech language pathologists to define, redefine, extend the meaning of who is a speech language pathologist and what does a speech language pathologist do. And thank you for providing me with this opportunity that is highly and necessary, needed and required. Speech language pathologists have grown over the years and very early on, they would take language to be a bulk of receptive language, words, and another bulk or treasure, treasure box, is the vocabulary, the expressive vocabulary. And then we moved up the scale of things and we started to take language to be comprehending and producing, uh, formulating. And to cut the long story short, there is a group of speech language pathologists 
who have come to perceive language in a bigger frame, that of content, form, and use. And the developmental speech language pathologist working from a relationship-based approach. Think of, rightly so, from the beginning, there is language and there is speech. And speech, as we all know, is the capacity, if you wish, to articulate words. And language, yes, it's a bulk of knowledge, content, world knowledge, whereby there is structure, which is the expressive side, the, the grammar, the structure, the form, the pattern, the rules of the linguistics. And then there is the use, which is actually the social act. Now, most importantly for the developmentally relation-based speech-language pathologists, the frame we're working from is that we are born as infant with the potential for language. This potential grows into a capacity and within interaction with a significant other, and by then we can think of mom, dad, especially if we are talking about infant, newly born, going through the scale, developmental scale, of nurturing this capacity for language. It happens within interaction to carry meaning to the structure form of the linguistics, whatever it is, Spanish, French, uh, Italian, Mandarin, English, uh, English, English, British English, American English, it is picked up and learned and grow and develop within that interaction. And this was really one of Dr. Greenspan's big insights when he was conceptualizing the developmental individual differences relationship-based model was that humans all develop in the context, mammals all develop in the context of social interactions with their caregivers. And so you're saying how this has really influenced the developmental relationship-based speech and language therapy. It is a much bigger view of speech and language than earlier on. And so when we come to the question that one of your parents have asked, yeah, ultimately this is our goal to help our clients to develop that capacity. It's not a skill, it's a capacity. And when we talk about the capacity as a developmental relation-based speech-language pathologist, we know that this capacity develops within interaction with a significant other in relation to five other domains. There has to be the capacity for thinking, for logical thinking. Capacity for play, capacity for social, emotional communication and interaction, etc. And those domains grow together. So when I meet my kiddo for the first time, I am looking at where is his level of functioning in social interaction communication vis-a-vis -vis language, relationship with others, and the linguistic level and complexity of use of that tool that we call language. And I also look 
if the child is verbal, at his speech. Now, we know, and I, I'm going to use I for the developmentally based relationship speech language pathologist. When we are looking at the level of functioning of the child, we are looking at the prelinguistics, we're looking at the preverbal, we're looking at the quality of the interaction. And that brings us to the foundational capacities that precede language, which is regulation, emotional regulation, sensory, sensory motor self-regulation, and the ability to share and to attend. And that brings to mind the podcast that you've done with Amanda Bins. And this was from a podcast I did with Amanda Bins, a Toronto speech and language pathologist on supporting the development of self-regulation, where she described how self-regulation is used by speech and language pathologists to support communication based on a publication of hers that came out at the time. I look at engagement. How do I engage with him? Or does he engage with me? And if he does engage, does he engage independently? Or does he require support and how much support? And that goes for regulation as well. The next thing I look for is the back and forth, the reciprocation. Is he able to build relationship? Is it easy to develop that relationship that carries that engagement? How is the back and forth? How does he center himself, his sense of self in this back and forth? And then is he coming with the ideas? And if he's coming with the ideas or thoughts or feelings or experiences, if he's sharing that, is he doing it independently with an intent and a purpose to share? Or does he require support? Do I have to elicit? And how much support does he need? And then if he is at that level, and let me stop here. And because a thought came to my mind. And these are the same foundational capacities that are outlined in the developmental individual differences relationship based model, the functional, emotional, developmental capacities. And we focus on the first six and you're going through them with such rich meaning. And Dr. Tippy calls them foundation academics because until you have that foundation of social, emotional capacities, you're not able to build on that in a meaningful way beyond memorization. Those capacities that are developmentally acquired, their capacities, they're not skills, they're not connected to a specific age. It's not because he's five years old, that means he can do all what I've mentioned. It's a capacity that is interdependent with five other domains. And it reflects at the level of sharing ideas, his logical thinking, his ideas, depth of ideas, his perception of feelings and the range of feelings, the depth of his experience, and all this happens maybe not at the verbal, like the 10 year old conversational back and forth, but maybe around play. So where is his level of play? Is it at the sensory experiential? Is it at the constructive? Is it at the symbolic? And I know in the floor time manual from the Greenspan floor time approach, Jake Greenspan, Dr. Greenspan's son, 
talks about those three levels of play. The first, the sensory play, then the object play, which you called construction, and then the symbolic play. I'm looking at all that, and I'm also searching if the child having all those capacities in one moment, one moment of back and forth, all this happens. If the child is functioning at that capacity of sharing ideas, is he able to bridge between ideas, feelings, experiences of his or hers? And then in my negotiation and response in the back and forth, is he able to bridge between his experience and my experience? And once I understand the capacity along those actually pre-linguistic foundational capacity for language, once he's sharing ideas, I'm going to look at his verbal language, just as his nonverbal language, his eye gaze, his referencing, his coming to me. What is he coming to me approaching to show me or to ask me for help? To show it and keep it. He needs help and he's not asking for help. I don't need the verbal. I need the nonverbal. If he looks at me and he's trying to fix something, he is asking for help. If he's verbal, he may say, help me, or I need help. And the emotion and the meaning is projected. He has a range of emotion. Same for when we bridge. This is the point at which I look if the child is at that level of functioning. How much language does he have? And by language, I don't just mean verbal. I mean the nonverbal together with the verbal as a complex system that he's using to connect with me. All this is, a, is in the moment. It could be five, 10 minutes. This is why when there is a new referral, do you have a clip? Three minutes. It gives me a feel as to where is the child's level of functioning. And once I am able to determine, sometimes it doesn't happen from the first meeting. Sometimes it takes much more. Sometimes it happens with mom or dad. They are the significant others. They are the comfort zone. I am a novel person. He doesn't figure me out yet. If I look at his interaction with his parents and I look at his interaction with me, there is a basal level and there is a ceiling level. I need to determine that. So once I decide to plan a therapeutic plan of action, I come where he's at, maybe a little bit less, and then start harnessing his own internal drive to help us, mom, dad, significant others, myself, and himself to get in that context, in that interaction, in that content to let him experience, perceive, and feel, and learn the next step. And it could be in terms of regulation. It could be in terms of engaging in, with an intent and a purpose, reciprocating and maintaining, asserting a sense of self, and sharing. And at that point, if those foundational capacities are not yet there working for him, I'm not going to go for speech. Even if his words, he uses words, and there are articulation errors, um, patterns, phonological patterns, I'm not going to address his speech. 
I'm not going to address his grammar. I'm not going to address his use of language. I'm going to make sure that those pre-social, pre-linguistic foundational capacity are working for him so he would be open to share. And it is so important that you say a basal level to a ceiling level because Dr. Greenspan pointed out that when kids are diagnosed, often they're in really stressful settings with strangers in an uncomfortable place and they're really put under that stress so that they're not showing us their um, highest developmental potential in that moment or their their ceiling, as you would say, and that we really need to consider their ceiling, their the capacity that they're at. And so I think that is an important consideration. There is the structure, there is the road map in my head, but I am focused in what he's bringing to the table and I'm supporting him. I need to harness his internal drive to help him acquire those foundational capacities and then when he's cooking in the back and forth i will address the linguistic associated with meaning and then i'm gonna address how he's making his words i need to keep his sense of self solid so he would take risks with me and again it's about that sense of safety giving our children a sense of safety that dr poor just talked about in the polyvagal theory podcast how essential it is to take down those defenses so that our children are free to explore and develop when i am doing that mom the significant other the person who has been there for him since conception is with me on the same page to be able to maintain this not for just an hour or two hours when they come in no on a more consistent regular basis plus if he is being successful with his parents, the payoff is much, 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 much greater than with me. I don't stand a chance as the parents, if they are in sync with their own kids, supporting, co-regulating, enabling, from a place of strength, not addressing the weaknesses. You help those areas of need, but you are holding him where his strength is. Right, the concept in floor time of following his lead or following the emotional intent of the child so that they're motivated to be engaged and and interact with us. We're working with their agenda, not with ours. That is the relationship-based perspective, view, frame, that a developmental relationship-based speech language pathologist is working. And this is where you had the podcast. It was with uh, Melanie. The, what is what makes me as a speech language pathologist different from another speech language pathologist is how are we taking language to be and how we develop language right the joy in communicating podcast with melanie feller who's a speech and language pathologist in the new jersey area who's self-reg trained as well language is a social act that is meaning if I am not addressing that capacity within a meaningful context for the child, not for me, it's not going to trigger anything in the child's own experience. 
And because this question that we started with, Daria, is constantly taking place, and I understand from where it's coming, and it's not the parents, it's us as speech language pathologists, we have not defined ourselves over the years, and I need to do it since the first start. Since I see the parent, this is how I am trained, this is my experience, this is what I believe in, and this is where we need to stand together. Absolutely. It really is just a way of framing the developmental individual differences relationship-based model as applied in the speech and language therapy arena. <laughs> because really that's what everybody doing DIR floor time does. But really what you're describing is something that parents don't hear a lot about because we don't understand that early child development and the development of those early social, emotional, functional, developmental capacities that neurotypical children develop almost seamlessly and naturally through infancy and early toddlerhood that our kids are still struggling with in terms of um, being able to relate with others in a way that's reciprocal in terms of being able to have long chains of back and forth gestural communication and checking in um, interactions and it certainly is the case that autistics communicate differently and we are expecting them to communicate the way we communicate and a lot of autistics and self-advocates say well if you were looking for the signs you would see that we are communicating with us and that that is what we do in the dir model we look for that nonverbal communication we look for any kind of gestures or any kind of you know body movements overtures glances to sort of interpret what the child is trying to express and that's what you're saying by meeting the child where they are developmentally finding you know where where is that spot they're at and how can we meet them there and progress them along that developmental ladder or progression and only after the acquiring of certain capacities does language tend to come so you know i remember with our son it seemed like he was just aimlessly wandering around the room it didn't matter what we said or did he seemed to ignore us and the more i've learned about floor time the more i understand now he wasn't ignoring us he just wasn't turning and attuning to us in the way that we would expect or that way that neurotypical children do but he is doing a lot more of that now that he's 11 but those skills develop those capacities not skills <laughs> those capacities developed slowly through interactions with all of these warm and nurturing supportive relationships he's made with his floor time therapists and with us being floor time parents and really supporting him. When some of the parents who come with quite young children who might, you know, they might still be two and three and they're in that stage that I described my son was in, they're sort of wandering around and, and they're trying, they're new to floor time, they're really trying like, oh look at that oh can i help oh you know trying to use the affect and the warm prosodic voice as dr poor just spoke about in in the podcast i did with them a few weeks ago where we're co-regulating with the child to try and let them know we're there but the child is just doing different things and parents don't really know where to start so it, it sounds like okay Jahan is going to assess where my child is. She's going to see where all the capacities are. If my child can do this and that, but what if my child isn't doing any of those things yet? How do I get them there? And so let's start now with, you're now coaching the parents. You've now assessed the child. How do you help the parents move that child along? As we meet and as I have the privilege to 
try to connect with the child and is the child reaching to the parents is the child approaching me is the child onto his object of interest if we're far away and trying to connect i still don't know how how is his sensory sensory motor system coming together for him to be able to multitask focus on what he is doing and focus on the coming in stimulation i don't know whether he feels that he's stressed emotionally being in a new place parents talking this new person this lady is talking it's too much noise i'm scared based on prior experience so i need to get in there to try to engage with him instead of getting him to engage with me and if i'm successful i need to engage with him with what he is busy with i'm not gonna ask him about what color it is i'm not gonna ask him what's it called i'm not gonna tell him can i see all this is putting demands the fact of just approaching a child in this context and in this moment makes me feel i need to understand first what's going on with him so maybe sitting close by just watching reading his cues and signs trying to guess at what he's doing approach him to where he is and enjoy it with him it's about him this moment is not about him performing for me is about me getting to know him and it's not by putting him under stress under the gun under the light is about me joining him to get that state of being calm focused willing to open up even a small crack in the door for me to exist with him now with the parents i'm gonna recognize appreciate and respect their parental concern about their own kid who is not coming to them but i'm gonna explain that with much appreciation and respect we need to put our fear on the side and look at him it is about him it is being with him it is building that trust relationship for him to be able to feel secure and look if he looked at me the way he looks the way he looks at his mom it's the language of the eyes we don't have to have the verbal when we talk we talk with much more than words we talk with our eyes facial expression body language gesture we feel the vibes of someone's body as he comes into the room or if he's sitting let's give ourselves a chance to get to know where is he remember in every moment there are five domains could be hyper alert his thinking his emotion his sensory motor and his language and in that language it is his own perception 
of what's going on in that moment. That is threatened with his emotion, completely disorganized because of the emotion, the fear, and his recollection of past experience. As Prezen said, and in his book, we have to take the other, being a parent or a child, in a mindful, humanly based understanding. I need to help the parent to slow down, get out of their own head, get into the child head, because he's the one who's still growing. Build that relationship, take his hand in a nurturing moment to help him feel secure. Yeah, uh, in our podcast with Dr. Rick Solomon of The Play Project, he talked about these parent-mediated models that work so much better because the parents are the ones that spend the most time with the children. You get the parents who say, but he's rambunctious, he's going all over the place, he is. Ask why. Why does he need to do that? What's going on? Or why is he sitting in the corner? Instead of judging, let's get more educated, more aware, more mindful, more insightful of another person and put ourselves. Yeah, as a speech language pathology, when I have parents and I have the kid, I am also in a moment, will I be able or will I be not able? Will I fail it or will I succeed? I have my five domains working at the same time. Put this aside. Focus on the child. Focus on the parent. And it is so dynamic that there isn't a list of things that the parent has to do. We need to get in touch with ourselves. What's going on with ourselves? And tell ourselves that there is light at the end of the tunnel for that moment, just look into it once you're done. Get busy with paying attention to what's going on with the kiddo. To break through. This is your goal. This is your intent. This is your purpose. Not with questions. And definitely not with testing questions. Because the kiddo then just goes back and walks in even more doesn't have the word to say, stop it. He doesn't have even the nonverbal capacity to put his hand up, to do this, to look with his eyes with anger. He's vulnerable. Do we know what does it mean to be vulnerable? If we know, then we can empathize, sympathize, be compassionate and take ourselves as the sole person who can get in there and connect. The five domains grow interdependently. You cannot work the speech. You cannot work the language without minding the level of functioning in the other five domains. And this is what I appreciate of the GIR floor time. It confirmed and give me the words and give me the understanding of how those domains work together. And I have to consider them. I may not be the person who is knowledgeable about the development of that sensory motor processing capacity that I can call on to an OT to understand what where is that child's level of capacity. Same for play. Play we as a speech language pathologist we adopted it from the clinical psychoanalytical clinical and psychiatric field. We're not going to analyze the child on the basis of play, but we're going to understand where he's at in terms of ideas. Is he just fiddling with it? 
or is he taking it and putting it to something else and building something or is he pretending where is he so i can know my grounds get in there where he's at build that relationship harness his interest and thrill to be in that moment with me take me on so i can work with the breadth of the three pieces of language content form and use while he's regulated yes while he's interested in the engagement while he's reciprocating while he's coming in with an intent and a purpose now i've given this example before but i'll give it again so in the early days of my son's floor time he would have speech language therapy session and it wouldn't be the kind that he had when he was still in the rehab hospital that was more behavioral based where they'd sit him at the table put a seat belt on stick something in front of him hold up pictures and apple apple or whatever <laughs> i'm just making that up but whatever it was it might have been around something that is his interest, like maybe a book about a train, but he had no interest. He couldn't sit still fidgeting. So once I saw the difference of floor time, it just turned the world around. So he loves those. Um, actually, he hasn't played with them in years. I wonder if he still likes them. <laughs> those gumball machine balls that are super bouncy. It's like, boom, woo, when they fly all over the place. And so they would literally be in a big hallway bouncing these balls and there was a big huge plant like a tree type thing in the area of the lobby and the ball would go behind. Oh no, it went behind the plant or is it under or is it uh, over or oh it's so fast, <gasps> blah blah blah, stuff like that. And that gave him the context for the language and the emotional connection to the language because he loved finding those balls. And he may not have yet been able to say behind, under, over, quickly, <laughs> but he's now hearing it. And can you talk about the speech language content form use of that example? Definitely. Amazing. The earlier definition of the therapy that he had is relying on the therapist's understanding of language and how language develop and how we foster the capacity of foreign language fragmented with the more recent understanding of language whereby language carries meaning and it has this meaning has to pertain to the individual it's not memory based it is meaningful based and maybe the therapist wasn't addressing his use but only saw that the understanding of those location actually their visual spatial conceptual understanding tying it with something that is considered a driving power that he is interested in he's not after learning the behind beside under he is after finding those balls and he saw in his joy of finding it or looking for it hearing a word again and again and again he's not there to memorize it he's there to find that ball but it so happened that this word kept on being repeated and it was rewarded when he found the boss they respected the i the individual differences and that he needs vestibular input. So he was moving the whole time, running and catching the ball, throwing, moving his arm, needing that 
visual stimulation of things moving as well as his body moving. And that kept him regulated enough to then get the engagement and share the back and forth interactions with the therapist because they were all having fun together and right. had a good so relationship. Just, we're talking about the more than one domain here. And the therapist knew what she needs to be able to get him to engage in that back and forth and then there is also the ideation of the rubber ball and his interest in it. And while giving him the sensory, sensory motor, the visual, spatial, temporal, and the central auditory processing, is it behind? Is it under? And then, no! in between and here is the rubber ball so we don't we are more of a 3d conceptual human being where everything comes together in the same moment to get us going and interested there is another game that I have found they're very much interested in those tower or race tracks with marbles. Uh, for some of the kiddos, it is again a visual, spatial, temporal. The marble is the crust of the and coming down so fast, so slow. It's language kick in. I no longer need, like in the good old times, 30 years ago, need to sit, to work with language using cards, using books. It's life. It's in the action that the kiddo learns the language the conceptual part of it, the emotion, the feeling, while they are engaged in a trusting relation, everything comes together. And just before we wrap it up, um, can you just quickly name off the five domains again for listeners? There is the language one, there is the logical thinking, there is the play, and each one of those domains have their developmental scale. And so this is why we say they, the kiddo needs to be at the same level of functioning across domains. I cannot teach the child I want cookie and he recognizes I want cookie by a personal pronoun, the action want, the object cookie, when perceptively, cognitively, he is not perceiving three element situation. This is why we say one word, and then it grows into two word combination. And then it goes into three word combination. And it has to be experienced, perceived, seen, touched, felt. In the play for the perceptual and the language domain to be working together while in the play, you see the three domains coming together and then the social emotional, that's the fourth, and the sensory motor. So those are the domains that we need to check in and see how they all merge together in a situation and then get at this level. And it is portrayed in his language, not descriptive language. 
not the language that he has memorized, but his, what I call his true language, his, the language that he owns, the language that he generates, reflects the level of thinking, the range of emotion, the complexity of the emotion, the level of play. So each one of them is a window to where the kiddo is at and give the right just challenge. Don't go out here. He's going to be stressed. Regulation goes down. And that's really the whole point that you said, meeting them where they're at developmentally, not coming in way up here or, um, or too low. You're meeting them where they're at and you're looking for that uh, zone of proximal learning as uh, that Vygotsky term in development. So the complexity of the mode all happens at the same time. I don't want people to think, oh, I have to work only with the regulation. I only have to work only with engagement. I have to only work with the reciprocation. Uh, no, no, it depends. If the child is coming with an idea, you need to make sure that he is solid with all the others before you take him from sharing ideas to negotiating reality, his reality and mine, and bridge it. I cannot go forward unless the ground is solid. Otherwise, the building collapse. Well, thank you so much. It, it was such a rich context to understanding the developmental approach to speech and language therapy. And I'll certainly put links in the blog post at affectautism.com. I will post links to the different aspects of floor time that we discussed. I have many podcasts on blogs on how to get all of those different yes. aspects cooking, as you mentioned. And this was such a nice overview to describe the process and what to expect from a developmental speech and language pathologist. So thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to defining the developmentally based relationship or the developmentally relation based speech language pathologies. Thank you very much. And listeners, tune in at affectautism.com. Uh, go there to look at the blog post with links to all the different things we discussed. And we'll see you next time. Until next time, here's to affecting autism through play.